Well, hello and good evening and welcome to Talk Leadership with Cedric. Everybody needs a little TLC. You know, Talk Leadership with Cedric is where we focus on leadership and personal growth with uh, business leaders, educators, local thought leaders. Our goal is to introduce our audience to leaders who are making an impact with innovative ideas and thoughts. Tonight, I'm going to introduce you to uh, another dynamic uh, leader. Tonight, uh, we're also going to explore a few things. You know, our guiding leadership principle is this, the law of co uh, contribution. Growing yourself enables you to grow others. You can't give what you don't have. So first, you must grow yourself to be able to grow others. We believe outstanding leaders like yourself will help us help others. So tonight, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, I want to start off, though, with what um, I want to give you some priorities. And we talk about the law of priorities. And tonight, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, priorities around managing time and managing your time. And, you know, you can't manage time. You can't control time. It's going to move with or without you, right? Um, however, what you can manage and you can improve on are how you prioritize things, right? It's not time that's the problem. It's what we do with it. Um, and, you know, you, there are priorities that um that uh, come up and uh we're going to so we're going to talk about managing time and managing those, pro those priorities and what i tell people is this um when you manage two things in life you control everything that happens in your life uh the first thing you do is when you manage your um time you see time was not going to stop for you time is going to continue to move um, wh whether you're uh, there or not, that's what's going to happen. But when you control your time, the person that manages their time the best is going to be the person that's going to be most effective. And when you can control your time, you control 50% of what happens to you in life. The other thing is when you control finances. When you control your finances, then you control the other 50% of things of what happens to you in life. And so we're going to explore uh, priorities and, and, and those things tonight. But my guest is here. So I want to um, introduce uh, my guest. You know, I, every week I always do what I say is a proper introduction of my guest. So I want to introduce uh, my guest tonight. Um, Ron Celestine is the sixth of eight children born to the late Milton Celestine Sr. and Beatrice Celestine of Brobridge, Louisiana. Uh, Ron graduated from Brobridge High School and, and, um, and after high school, he went on to University of Southwest Louisiana, now known as Lu uh, University um, of Louisiana Lafayette, uh, where he obtained his Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Um, he and his lovely wife, Stephanie, have been married for 34 and a half years, and they currently reside in Cypress, Texas. To this union, they have two children, Ronald II, who lives in Tokyo, Japan, and his daughter, Sharita, who is a fourth grade math teacher at in Houston Independent School District. Uh, Ron also has two grandsons, Mason and Mugen. Ron's professional career primarily consists of working at General Mills, uh, General Mills Incorporated, where he has spent the last 35 years. His current position is the retail team manager in Southwest Texas. Uh, Ron is a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and is the 24th Western Region Vice President. 
He is a lifelong Catholic and a member of St. Mary's of Purification Catholic Church in Houston's Third Ward, uh, where he also serves on a few committees. He's the uh, he's a member on the um, uh, parish finance council, and he chairs the money counter committee. That's the committee I want to be on. Um, in addition to his involvement with with Alphas and his church, Ron has served as a big brother uh, for Big Brothers Big Sisters of America since 2007, 2008 school year. In his spare time, Ron is an avid runner and enjoys running five to six times per week. And trust me, folks, he does this crazy five to six times per week um, and working out in the gym um, when we're not in a uh, obviously in a uh, health pandemic. So let's welcome my friend Ron Celestine to the show. Hey, hey, Seth, how you doing? Uh, first, right. let me just say, can you hear me clearly, Seth? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks for that warm introduction, and thanks for the invitation to be a part of your uh, your podcast this evening. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting with you and providing whatever little knowledge I might be able to bring to the table and hopefully help benefit somebody. Sure, absolutely. So, Ron is um, also not just a guest. Ron is uh, a good friend of mine. He is a part of my inner circle. There are, there are four guys that, that we hang out together um, uh, from time to time. And, you know, e each guy has a little bit different uh, thing and personality and, and all this type of stuff. And Ron is the guy that is the exercise uh, health guru of our group. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, every now and then I tell him I'm, I might go run with him, but normally he's running on the street and I'm running to the refrigerator. So it, you know, it kind of works out. Uh, it's a little bit challenging to, uh, to do that, but, um, uh, let's welcome Ron to the show. And tonight guys, we're just going to do what we do every week and, and we're going to let, uh, you know, ask some questions, have a conversation and, and let Ron, uh, kind of pour into you tonight. Um, so Ron, you know, one of the first things I want to uh, talk about is you've had a long career um, with General Mill, uh, General, with General Mills, and um, so I want to I want to start there from a you know uh, let the audience get to know who you are. Tell the listeners about your journey to leadership and uh, how did you get to where you are today? Oh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the truth is. Um, I remember coming out of high school, actually going off to college. And um, that journey kind of starts way back then, um, said, to, to be honest with you. Um, one of seven boys, we were a total of eight. And my mom and dad had always said, somebody of these knuckleheads got to go off to college. <laughs> and I think my number got pulled. And I remember going off to college and the, um, the biggest thing that still that that's kind of always would stand out to me was I couldn't fail because um, that was not an option. Um, mom, dad, you know, you had that whole family on your show there. And then all my brothers who chose not to go to college said, come on, man, that's not that hard. You should be able to make this work. <laughs> so that journey really, I would say, started back then. And I remember um, as a kid, we grew up on on a farm. So I did a lot of hard work there. So I would say that's probably where the journey really would start is learning how to work and work hard and uh, appreciate and have a, a profound appreciation for that. So going off to college was the same thing. You know, you bust your butt, do what you can, graduate, uh, and then go find a job. And I remember when I went off to, at the time, USL um, and coming out, you know, people were saying all these stuff about USL, they'll be able to help you get a job and everything else. And the funny thing is when I graduated, I was about to graduate, I'm like, damn, I don't even have an offer. And then I moved to Houston, um, still didn't have an offer. And then I got an opportunity, um, a friend of mine, when we talk, I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about networking this evening. A guy that was a coach of mine when I was in high school, um, he, he kind of, he knew me from high school and he said, hey, you've always been a good student. Um, you should look into sales. And I'm like, sales? I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I tried that when I was in college and I remember, um, <laughs> I remember vividly trying to sell Kirby vacuums, going door to door and knocking and trying to sell that. And I'm like, man, I sucked. I mean, I don't think I, <laughs> well, I know I did. 
I didn't sell one vacuum cleaner to anybody. I mean, I, it was like pulling teeth just to let them let me do a demonstration. So um, when he told me, he said about sales, I'm like, oh, uh, that's not for me. He goes like, no, Ron, it's it's different. It's it's really a whole different ball game. It's uh, consumer food sales. And I'm like, tell me a little bit more. And he started telling me a little bit about this opportunity where you would call on grocery stores and get to learn a little bit about um, your coming. They know who you are. You're representing reputable brands. It's a solid company and all that other good stuff. So I said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm interested, you know, um, I was out of college then, maybe about five months. I was working at the time at, um, oh gosh, I can't even remember. I think it's Aaron's Rental Furniture as an assistant manager. And that, and I knew that couldn't be long-term to be perfectly honest and candid with you. And so when I got the opportunity, he said, hey, we've, we've got some, uh, we want you to fly back to Louisiana and interview back on my college campus, the campus that I couldn't even get an interview with when I was there for four years. So I, I had an interview, uh, the interview went well. And then um, that was back in 1985. And I remember they told me, they said, we've got some good news and some bad news. I said, okay, let's start with the good news. They said, well, we like you. We want to give you an opportunity. I said, great. What's the bad news? They say, you have to start back in Louisiana. And I'm like, oh hell, I just left Louisiana. So my first assignment was in Louisiana. And I, and interestingly enough, I worked in your part of the country. Uh, my first territory was actually covered Lake Charles. And uh, I remember going up and down Lake Charles and uh, there was a, I'm trying to get this Buddha in place that I used to, I think you and I might've talked about it before. Oh, Apes. I think it was yeah. Apes. Yeah, I called on Apes grocery stores and some of those things and cash and carry and some of those. And they continue to you know do well there, and then they promoted me, and I had an opportunity uh, about a year, maybe not quite a year. Got married, then transferred back to Houston, and then started getting on that that opportunity where you get to more assignments, more responsibility. Keep doing that, keep doing that, and then one year, uh, then a couple, then I had an opportunity to move to Denver, uh, which is kind of funny. You talked about the Rat Pack. Uh, I call it the Rat Pack. The four of us. And I guess when I first first met um, Gary, when I moved to Colorado, um, I said I was going to be in Colorado for only about two years with or without General Mills. And I met that. I had no intention on staying in Denver. But it goes to show about when you kind of go to a place and you don't let your destination be between your ears and let it kind of run its course. Yeah. And uh, I remember going there and it was kind of funny. Um, I was going to be there for two years, you know, and I was just like, let me do like two years and get the heck out. And after the first year, I kind of just complained. And I tell that to everybody when I mentored them the day, I stop complaining, embrace it, give it a shot, and then you see what happens. And after the first year, I started kind of taking in Colorado and then I didn't want to leave. And then every opportunity that came on, I said, I'm not ready to go, I'm not ready to go. We started raising our kids and ended up staying there 15 years. Subsequently, we got a chance to um, I travel. I was calling on some accounts in California and then when the opportunity came up, um, I either had to move to, I, everything was getting shut down in the Colorado area. So because I was able to, I don't know, get a little bit of a, some cred, if you will, I had the opportunity to pick where I wanted to go. So they said, well, you know, what kind of, what cities you would like to move to? And my wife's from Texas. So I said, I'd like to, you know, I wouldn't mind going back to Texas. I said, oh, by the way, there's only two cities in Texas, Houston or Dallas. Do not give me anything else. I'm not going <laughs> anywhere else. And, uh, so we came back to Houston. I think it was like 2005, right before Katrina hit, uh, or maybe the same year Katrina hit. So we moved back. Uh, I came, actually I came in 2004. My family came in 2005. And uh, I've been here since. Uh, got some different opportunities to do different things and now have an opportunity to lead a retail team of about 16 people. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So one of my good friends out of uh, Florida, Melbourne, Florida, uh, Ray Lee asked, what kind of form? I'm sorry, say one more time. Um, he asked what type of form. Uh, you said you uh, was on a form. Oh, uh, oh, we had everything, man. Uh, I learned how to drive on a tractor, believe it or not. But that was, a, we primarily did okra and we had um, pepper. We did cabbage. We did corn. Um, I didn't do cotton. I'm not quite that old. I know I'm old. I know Seth <laughs> kind of, kind of said, but I know I'm a pretty old guy, but I didn't do cotton. But, um, and as crazy as that may sound, after doing all of that, you think I'd be smart enough to stay away from the farms? I actually even tried some potatoes uh, to make some extra money. I think I did that twice and I said, man, this is, that's too much work, I can't do that. But uh, yeah, that was probably, that's the farms I've worked on. I would say okra, cabbage, corn, and pepper. 
Okay. All right. Well, that's one thing I never did. I don't think I want to do it either. Um, (laughs) So, you know, leaders come in all different packages with different strengths, right? So what strengths um, do you feel are important for successful leaders? Oh, boy. Boy, that's a loaded question. And and even though you didn't prep me, I knew that question was going to come down the pipeline, right? Some form <laughs> right. or another. We're talking about leadership. You know, there's all kinds, to be honest with you. I used to, when I would talk to groups, they'd say, are leaders born or can they be developed? And boy, that's a, that's a four or five hour conversation. Um, I think some of the most important qualities, though, of a good leader is, um, number one, can you listen? You know, it, that being able to listen first and foremost, to understand, fully understand, and then be able to network. And when some things you just are not going to be good at, being able to trust, uh, being vulnerable, if you want to call it that, to mm-hmm. lean on other folks, bring a strength to the table that can help you to get to not only your goals, but that whole team's goal. Uh, that'd probably be the first thing I would say is just being able to listen would be the first skill set uh, of a good leader. To be able to listen, uh, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about hard work. Hard work comes in many fashions. You know, people, some people you have what I call the early risers, and then you have some that I call the late, the late um, bloomers, if you will. Um, depending on what time it is. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is being flexible. Uh, you have to be, as a good leader, I think uh, one of the key traits for is to be flexible um, and understand. And in, and if you're talking about today, you better you better be fluid because. Um, the stuff about coming home and saying, are oh, you waking up tomorrow morning? So, okay, my priority is going to be A, B, C, and D. The A priority becomes quickly a D priority. So if you're not able to adjust being agile, then that's that's going to get you as well. So there's a lot of stuff there, but I'd probably stop there and, and, and say those things kind of come to mind for me pretty quickly. Okay. All right. I, I love those. Uh, be, being a leader means be able to listen, be flexible, and be fluid. Absolutely love those. Um, hey, Ron, uh, Renee is on and Renee said, yes, you are old. <laughs> <laughs> Renee's been trying to say that, but uh, I am older than Renee. I'll say that. <laughs> Not um, by much. <laughs> so, you know, good leaders ask great questions and it kind of gets to what you, your number one point was. So good leaders ask great questions. What has been some of the best questions uh, that you've asked that you um, think make a big, that's made a big impact um, on on your career path, in your career path, rather? Well, I think the, boy, I'm I'm trying to put it in the form of a question. The thing that, number one is understanding, um, said the the biggest question I I probably asked was, it's not so much of a question as much as, can you show me? Uh, I tend to say that a little bit um, when it came to, for example, we're crossing over and talk a little bit about finances. Um, I said I was the first child to go to college, which means there was a lot of firsts. You know, there's not a mm-hmm. lot of people that was able to say to Ron, hey, Ron, when you go to work, understand what a 401k is. When you do this, when you, you know, what's the difference between this and what's that? So a lot of those things I didn't know. So I had to find the best question I was able to do was to find somebody who I can trust, who I can lean on. And again, ask those tough questions, not even so much tough questions, but some things where people, so oftentimes I, I'll talk to somebody who's been with a Fortune 500 company for five and 10 years, and you'll ask them, are you maximizing your 401 matching? And they go like, what's that? And mm-hmm. the fact that they didn't fully understand that or just ask that question. So my best question I probably asked was, you know, number one, I needed to understand the finance part, so that would be it. The second thing I always wanted to see, what does that career path look like? Uh, you know, whatever that first job that you had, what's those next two jobs that come behind that? Oh, and good. then the third thing was, you know, and then I, I would say, well, I had to learn to, to kind of, what do I really want? And that took me a while to, to stop chasing maybe what everybody else said I should want and find what you really want. So, but I would definitely say understanding not just this job. I, in fact, I just had a one of my um, my reps that called me about an opportunity that popped up, and she was super excited about it, and rightfully so. Her skill sets were just just right on point. But my first question to her was, "What's the next two positions after this one? And do you understand what those positions entail?" 
uh, rather that be relocation. Yeah, everybody talks about the money, but the money will come. You know that. Right. But it's understanding because that's something that I really, really want to do. And when you're able to kind of, I, I would say from a, my career or anybody's career, is ask the next two questions. A promotion is good, but sometimes um, is that really where you want to be? Right. Yeah, it's definitely important to make sure it's really getting to your why, right? You said, what are you really yes, want? That's really getting to it right there, right? Don't chase the dollars. It always sounds great. Oh, man, I want to go get. But if you, you could have a high paying job and you don't love it, every yeah. day you're going to get up like, oh, my God, not another day of this, right? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Ron, this is a, a question for you. And, and I, you know, I probably know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So um, what's your favorite dessert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, who, who asked? Who, who wants to ask that type of question? No, that's just my favorite that's a wild card question on my list. <laughs> uh, what can I do? Can I, can I take some liberties in, de in defining what I would call a dessert? You know, yes. because, and, uh, and let me say this before Ron answers. Let me say this. <laughs> so Ron, <laughs> he barely eats. I mean, I don't know how he lives. He just barely eats. Uh, now, the, uh, the, Gary, Derek, and myself, we eat all the time. Now, Gary eats the most and... I'm sorry, Derek probably eats the most, and, and then Gary, and then, you know, little me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, what are you? Oh, boy. Boy, man, that's such a good question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you two. Um, for Thanksgiving, Stephanie will always have a apple pie for me. A Mrs. Smith's apple pie is, that's, that's tradition for me. And any other time, if she's going to pick one thing, a dessert for me, it's going to be apple pies. If you say, what's my really best dessert? It would be pepper farm cookies. That'd be my, that's my number one dessert. Uh, I keep that company in business, uh, to be perfectly honest and candid with you. Um, it's, uh, it's the Milano cookies. It's the uh, dark double chocolate. That's my number one dessert. So that's why you go run 10 miles every day? <laughs> I actually, um, that, you know, it's funny. Um, it's, I don't know if we're going to talk about health, but actually I started. Yeah, we can, yeah, we do. Yeah, I would tell you because, uh, and, uh, and I do get a lot of flack about my running and my health. About oh, seven, eight years ago, I was diagnosed as being borderline hypertension. And I'm a very much an extremist. I'm going to go all the way to the left, all the way to the right. And sometimes I'll find some middle after about a year or two. The first thing I did, I went down almost every aisle in the store. Anything that had a high content in sodium, I just took off. I'm not eating that anymore. So needless to say, uh, anything on the frozen aisle, that's not, I, I don't do any of it. Pizzas, uh, ice cream happened to have a lot of sodium. So I guess I stopped eating ice cream just like that. And then I said, damn, I gotta find me a cooking. I've gotta find me some chips because before that, mm -hmm. my diet consisted of a Coke, um, Oreo cookies and potato chips. That's and that, that's kind of what I was wired to. So then I had to find me a cookie and the cookie that had the lowest amount of sodium at the time that I found was the Pepperidge Farm cookie. It didn't matter if I liked it or not, I learned to start to like it. I found potato chips, um, Zaps potato chip, a, a, a plug for, for Zaps. There's no salt potato chip and I started picking that up. And the funny part, people say, well, what the heck does that taste like, Ron? I said, living. They say, what does that mean? I said, the opposite of dying. So yeah. um, that's what kind of governed me from in, in, in picking that up. So that's that's probably how I got caught up on on, on that. And even what made me start running, because I didn't want to take medicine. So to not take meds, I started running. At first, I started walking because I could not run, literally could not run. But the more you stayed with it, like anything in life, I, I, I went from barely able to run 100 meters to running half marathon. So just a yeah. stick uh, stick to it. And and I will say, you know, in all seriousness, uh, Ron, uh, you're definitely an inspiration from that from that aspect of it. Uh, now, you know, I'm I'm not the, the runner. I'll get in here and, and, and work out. But um, it is uh, inspiring to see you and you always send us pictures. Right. When you finish a race, um, or when you're about to start a race. Um, so it is inspiring. So keep doing that. Um, uh, one of these days, Thank you. Gary, Derek, and I will catch on and, and we'll go with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hold you to that too. <laughs> 
So, you know, growth is intentional. You don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden you've grown. Now, I'm not talking about in size. I'm talking about in, in mindset and, and in thought. So um, what do you do for professional and personal growth and development? Boy, oh, Lord. I would say one word is it's intentional. Um, rather, it's the books you try to read. It's the people you try to surround yourself with. Um, uh, you kind of mentioned in the introduction, uh, being involved with Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Um, some of that, um, you know, when they talk about, um, about, um, what makes you and who you are, it's, it's that, um, sometimes it's who you surround yourself with is equally important. I know folks who read a lot of books and, um, and, and that's good. And that works very well. Um, some people are very religious and that's good too. And, and that works well. For me, I try to do a little bit of everything. I try to read, um, make time to read. I, and I'm doing a horrible job now at getting back to reading. But what I've always tried to surround myself with, with people who bring something to the table that I can grow from, you know, rather it's a text message from you and Gary and, and, and uh, said on, in, on in, um, Derek on investments, or it's on the fraternity. Last night, we sat through a Zoom call and we got an opportunity to hear some psychiatrists, um, psychologists talk about the importance of maintaining a strong mental health um, during this time. And, and trust me, I had a crazy schedule yesterday and didn't finish till about two o'clock this morning. Um, but I thought it was important enough to, to sit there. Number one, if somebody takes that kind of time to uh, put something together from you, there's something you can take away from that, that you can incorporate into whatever you're trying to do. When I'd go off to meetings with General Mills, um, one of the things I would do is take copious notes and come back and, and, and start doing it. My kids probably used to hate it, but I would <laughs> try to put that back into my kids. You know, I would go over it. I remember one of the best classes, and that's one of the things when you said about your, your mindset and being intentional. Um, I didn't, and I still don't believe in just doing my job. I do everything it takes, if you will. And one of the things that I remember, um, one of the classes I got an opportunity to go to was called Efficacy for People of Color. And it, it really helped to destroy several of those myths that were out there where some folks may have felt that they somewhat were a little bit better than you and, um, and kind of bought into that. And unfortunately, we buy into that as well. So mm -hmm. learning how to have a growth mindset now more than ever that I'm intentional about what I do and what I say. I'm also very, very conscious that people are watching us and, and that just an example, you mentioned my two grandkids, but also have our children. So some of the things that we say and what we do, um, the church, uh, the, the young people in the church are constantly coming over and saying, hey, here's how you're doing this and, and what, what you're doing there. The funniest thing that happened to me one day, I was at church, I had to do a presentation. And uh, like you, I kind of like bow ties too. And uh, had a bow tie and I was doing a financial report and it was the, the most amazing thing. It was a, a little three-year-old kid and his mom came over and his dad came after. I could not make him wear this tie. He never wants mm -hmm. to wear this bow tie. Mm -hmm. He sees you with the bow tie up there. And now he's like, mom, mom, put my bow tie on, put my bow tie on. <laughs> so when you talk about a mindset at a very, a very, very young age, it, it, it starts to be and become who you are. Um, so some of the things I'm constantly doing, Sid, I think the biggest thing I do is the people I surround myself with. Um, even with my team, they say, well, you don't let your guards down much. I said, well, there's some, there's some people that I, I, you know, that I'll do that a little bit more of that with. But mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is uh, you're constantly, I don't like to say you, you're, on a, you're on a stage, but you are on a stage, if you will. So the, the, my growth, the, my biggest thing that I do is the things I surround myself and the people I surround myself with. Um, during this COVID-19, we had an opportunity at General Mills where we, we took everybody out the field for about six weeks and we had intentionally just put a lot of training. And that training helped me go back to some of the drawing boards and remember some of the things that some of the basic foundational stuff. And uh, if it doesn't make sense, you know, push back, ask. Um, in our conversations and collaborations, that's probably where my biggest mind and growth set comes from. Uh, that is that's uh that's definitely awesome um and ar around that question i had a couple people um in the chat ask so give us some book recommendations yeah yeah you know um i like everybody likes to talk about think and grow rich um those things you know that's the one that every you know that's what everybody goes go to that card that that that's 
one of the best books um, that I, I would tell you. But the best book for me, honestly, that I, I that I that gave me the best, uh, I would call it support, was the one that everybody probably takes for granted. It's that Bible. That's the book that I really go to um, when I really need to find something. I, I find a passage, uh, whether it be um, something from the old scripture, something from the new scripture. Uh, I try to find that in there. Um, the stuff about how to how to get rich, um, you know, investments, those things. You know, you read those books and stuff. But after you get to a certain point, it's not the books anymore. To be honest with you. Um, it's just talking to people and finding out from them the why behind that book. Uh, there's a there's an author that he still comes to mind. He wrote something called The Little Red Ball, and it was um, uh, Carol. And I got a chance to meet uh, I'm trying to think of Carol's for, uh, first name. And it's the Red Rubber Ball, and, and I listened to him, and I got a chance to listen to his podcast again a little bit more recently. And I remember when. 15 years, 20 years ago, and I heard him for the very first time. And he was talking about how we limit ourselves from when we were small kids. We were, we thought we could do anything that we, we wanted to. There was no boundaries, no limitations. And then this thing called the world starts to tell us what you can't do. Hmm. You can't run. You can't fly. You can't, you know, when I was a kid, he thought you could be Batman or Robin or one of those creatures who could fly. But his whole point was that we start to limit ourselves because we let everything that all we talk about is what we can't do. There's no focus on what we can do. So uh, reading his book, I, I found very, very inspirational just to talk about and then getting a chance to talk and meet him. Um, uh, one of my favorite reads is, is a small read. It's called um, Who Moved My Cheese? Mm -hmm. I love reading that. Over, over, uh, you know, and I made, not made, but strongly suggested my kids read it. Over and over, you know, and you made them read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, uh, and I suggested my wife read it. Um, but I think that you know, a simple read like that, though, said it just helped you get prepared for life because what we what it talked about so much was just waiting for stuff because it was there yesterday, it's gonna be back. And we talked earlier about being nimble and being able to to move and to go find it. If it's not there, what are you going to do? Just keep waiting or are you going to go and go find it? Um, so that's that was probably one of the um, best easy reads that, I, that I've that i done, to, to be perfectly honest with you, um, just to kind of wrap my head around. And then I, I obviously love reading. Um, for some reason, I've always liked to read autobiographies. I want to understand what they did, how they got there. And um, that that's always been... Uh, both inspirational and also uh, very informative for me to see some other people's paths and try to see what I can do along my path to help me get to some of those things there. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's interesting. It's amazing. It's not even interesting. It's, it's amazing how um, God brings all things together, right? So uh, Brother uh, Deacon Ray Lee out of Florida asked that question about the book recommendation. And you all yeah. said, hey, it's the Bible, right? Um, so brother Deacon Ray Lee is over there going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so funny because, um, so much of the stuff when people are looking for it, it's so foundational though, at the, at the very end of the day. Sure. And that's, that to me is it, you know, I, when people go through a challenging part in their life, I tell them about the Bible, but I, and I also tell them about this book called The Shack, which I thought was a very, very interesting read, which kind of. Uh, demystify this whole thing about who God is and to kind of humanize him in a, a place where you can come. I uh, had a good friend of mine who lost a son and um, and I recommended the book for him. I, the, he and I talked, uh, I sent him this book uh, called The Shack and he, you know, and I saw him a couple of years later and he said, man, I can't tell you, thank you enough because it began to help me with this transformation. So when people ask me for things that I read, you know, it's, I don't have the sexy, um, give them those other books. I, yeah, but this, it's the one that really, to me, have the profound part about life and helps me to be that much more important. Well, that's so awesome. That's the ones that I that I go. That, that's that that's awesome. That's outstanding. Now, Ron, you know, I would be uh, that's not a this question is not normally a part of my question bank, but I, I, I we can't uh, not have that conversation uh, today. And tomorrow night, I'm actually having a panel discussion. Um 
around the whole George Floyd situation and what's happening in America. And, um, you know, uh, earlier today, I was talking to some uh, uh, fellow members of the John Maxwell team and, and, and they're, they're Caucasian. And we were talking about my feelings and experience with, with all of this. And I told them, you know what, I, I, I'm used to these type things happening because I grew up in this skin. Right. Um, so yes. just, you know, uh, from your perspective, uh, just give us a little bit of uh, feedback, encouraging encouragement or something around what's happening today and how people can overcome and get through this difficult time. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And you're right. There's no way we can have a conversation and not have that conversation. Um, a couple of things I would tell you. My as tough as that moment was, and it is. Uh, right before that, we had a similar situation where another unarmed black man was obviously um, killed, hunted, if you will, in, in Georgia. That one actually hit even that much closer to home, to be honest with you, said, because like Ahmad, I'm a runner. And like Ahmad, a lot of times when you, you take running to kind of help you get away from, sometimes that's that's the way we unwind, if you will. Some people do this, some people do that. But for me, it's to go for a run. And, and, and like him, I like to run in my neighborhood for the most part um, in a safe, and I use that word purposefully, um, environment. And just to think about you, you know, I could be, that could be me because I could be doing the very same thing. You know, I'm running, minding my own business and out of the blue, somebody, number one, you have a headset on so you don't even see or hear them coming more times than not. Sure. And then all of a sudden, somebody is just, you know, your whole mindset and, uh, and, you know, to hear people talking about what I would have done and what, I, you know, you never know what you would have done in those situations. I think, though, to, to, to get to this question and at the heart of it, like you, I'm so sick of having to have these conversations. I never thought about it this way, but um, somebody asked me uh, recently, when you see these situations, aren't you happy your son lives in Japan? And I said, you know, I never even thought about it that way, but I could see where, that, where, where they were going with that you know, to not be subject to some of those same things that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, obviously, Mr. Floyd died, got killed, murdered in Minneapolis. Guess where General Mills' headquarters is? In Minneapolis, Minneapolis. you know, right? right there. So, um, and, you know, we, we have an organization called Black Champions Network um, within General Mills. And, you know, we get a lot of emails and things of, hey, Ron, and the whole BCN, we really, we feel for you. We're doing this, and 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 I think they they are sincere. I really do. I don't mean that facetiously at all. But my 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 response back to to them was very similar to what I said to uh, on my my post on Ahmad. The fact that um, somebody could be shot down, gunned down, and it took what a couple of months later before somebody even got arrested. Right. And then here, and here you watch a young man, you know, um, Renee talked about my age. He's Floyd's way old, younger than me, you know, so get pinned down and nobody thought enough to that this was a human being. And we talk about black lives being marginalized. We are, you know, they, they do marginalize our lives. And there was a song, there's a song by um, John Legend in, in Common that talks about and in that song, it talks about um, glory, but it talks about justice for all is not specific enough. And we have to be a little bit more vocal to say exactly what the challenges are. So one of the things I, I, I shared with General Mills and our executive leadership, our senior executive leadership team was this. It's a great idea to make sure that we create a safe workplace where uh, people can grow, where diversity is valued, and all of that stuff. I said, that, that's, that's, that's good, that's all well and done. But it doesn't do a lot of good if I get killed and murdered before I can cross the gate. Right. So we have to use our microphone. And my challenge to my company was, it's good to tell us internally, but what are you doing externally? What yeah. are you telling the world about how you feel about that? Yeah. And uh, I know Dr. King talked about, it's gonna take some good white people, and I don't mean that to be racist or nothing, but some innocent people to stand up and say, you know what, this doesn't bother me, but this is not right. Um, I got it. Somebody sent a video to me this weekend 
my coworker, and it was, and I apologize, I said, I can't remember the lady's name, but that's not the point. And she asked an auditorium filled with white women. She said, how many of you would like to be living as a black person in America today? Stand up. And then she said, she repeated it again. She said, okay, I obviously didn't, I didn't, y'all didn't understand my question. Let me say it again. If any one of you would like to be an African-American living in America today, please stand up. And then she proceeds to say, well, it's evident by no one standing up that you would not, that you would not want to be treated that way. So you know that it is wrong. Then my next question to you is how can you sit quietly and let it happen to others? So I think for me, I have a responsibility to go beyond my safe space, if you will, mm-hmm. and to project out in, 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 a, in a respectful way. But we have to challenge that comfortableness, if you will. One of the things I've always said to my teams that I manage was we have to true growth. You talked a little bit earlier about growing, Cedric. True growth happens when you become comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. That's where growth will actually occur. So my challenge to my company, and you know, I get the emails and whether it's the CEO or the CFO, it doesn't really matter. I send the same message back. What are we doing outside of our walls? And I was happy to hear my CEO say last week when we were talking to him, he popped into one of our meetings and said, one of the things that they had done was sign a letter, all the CEOs in the Minneapolis area denouncing that action. And, and, and more importantly, he said, that's not the last step, it's just the first step. But as crazy as that is to say, we've had several murders in similar types of murders. That's what I call them in Minneapolis. Didn't hear anything. So what I'm encouraged about today is that people are starting to stand up and be held accountable. And some people are just standing up and saying, hold me accountable. So Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by that. I think we have to continue to do that as well, you know, um, whether it be with our children and, and whatever space that we get to occupy, that we get an opportunity to tell people and show people. Um, yes, we're dissatisfied and whatever that that is and try not to get caught up in the other stuff. People have a tendency to kind of make you shift the um, the spectrum, if you will. They move it from here. We're not going to talk about the murder anymore. Let's talk about the looting. Uh, doesn't matter who was doing the looting, not necessarily the folks who are doing that. They're just the, 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 the protesting in a peaceful way. But it's, to, it's, it's how do we change the narrative? And our job is to make sure that the narrative doesn't change, that we bring them back on point and talk about the unjust and how do we start to fix these injustices. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love your response, Ron, um, and love the way that you challenge your organization. So, folks, this is what I want you to understand. Leaders don't just lead teams and people and be quiet. Leaders also challenge the process. They challenge the establishment. Sometimes you always want to be professional, respectful and courteous to other people. Right. Because you want that same thing back. But you can still challenge the process and push people outside of their comfort zone. Today, one of the the, the, uh, uh, people I was talking to sent me a message later and he said this, he goes, when, so I I said, look, one of the things that, that I have to do is when my son came here from North Dakota and he drove back, we said a, said a prayer before he left and we added in there, we uh, please Lord protect him from running into a racist police officer um, who could, you know, try to hurt him. And he was, resp- he sent me a message after me. He goes, I, I teared up when you said that. Cause I never thought about that or never, it, it never was in my awareness that, you know, you have to do that because I said, this is what we have to do. And you never have to do that for your son or daughter. Um, so it's, it's making other people aware and I know that th- there are a lot of opportunities to make people aware, but sometimes certain things don't come into your awareness because you've never experienced it, right? I'm sure that there are some things that are not in my awareness and, and your awareness because we haven't experienced some things, right? Um, so I-, I-, I love that, uh, Ron. So you have a couple of Alpha Brothers, uh, your Alpha Brothers that are that are listening to us tonight, Dr. Greg Salters. Uh, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who's a very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, I actually want to introduce you guys, but also uh, Kevin Pete, 
um, is listening in uh, as well. Uh, but Greg, uh, uh, Dr. Salters put on, uh, there's a video that he put in a link. I think you kind of referred to it. It's called Brown Eyed, Blue Eyed Study, um, or, or maybe mm -hmm. what's the same video, but he put that study in, uh, in the link for our audience uh, tonight uh, as well. So thanks, Doc. Um, the next uh, question for you, and it's kind of just a, uh, not even a, a, a serious question. I just want to get your, your take. You know, I know that, you know, we talk about sports. Now, let me say this. When we talk about sports, now, Gary, Derek, and myself watch sports live. Like, we watch the Super Bowl <laughs> on Super Bowl Sunday. Ron watches Super Bowl Sunday on March 1st. So he, you know, records it and then he goes back and listens to it. And then he sends us text messages with play by play like we didn't already know, <laughs> you know. This happens, so uh, <laughs> and I'm serious, folks. That happens, right? Um, so Ron, tell us your favorite NFL team. Um, uh, said won't let me lie because I would just holler and say one of the whoever won the Super Bowl last time, but um, actually, I'm a Denver Broncos fan, so uh, uh, and Gary would tell you I hated the Broncos for years, and I used to just make my day when they would lose, and then eventually, I finally they beat me up enough and I became a Broncos fan, so I'm still a Denver Broncos fan. So, you were not a Broncos fan when they were winning, now they're losing, and you're a fan. No, I was a fan when they won the Super Bowl. No, no let me be clear. I, uh, no, uh, I remember when I lived there, they would say, you're going to miss John Elway one day. And I'm like, oh, heck no. And now we're like, man, where's John Elway? <laughs> we need him. You know? so, yeah, it's, 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 it's been a long time since the um, Broncos were any good. Um, but hey, but you're, you're right, though, said I do not watch that stuff. No sports live anymore. Um, uh, DVR kind of gave me my life back, and um, and I actually, to tell you the truth, I don't even miss it. That's the funny part, you know. I know I give you a hard time, and uh, I do have some fun with that. Uh, LSU won the championship, uh, and I literally did not watch the game. I uh, my brother texted me. I was in LA, and I think it was about about five o'clock that that morning, and he's like, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, he's like, we won, and I'm like, LSU won. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I go to ESPN and try to get the highlights, but uh, so folks, I, I am dead serious when I say Ron watches it like weeks later and sends yeah. us text yeah. messages with play by play, <laughs> um, like he's telling us some like you know brand new news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, like, something's not right with me. I get it. <laughs> We have another Alpha brother that's listening in as well. We're gonna give him a shout out. He, uh, his name is Anwar uh, Aiken. Um, he's a good uh, friend of mine and a, a colleague here with the John Maxwell team as well. So you got your Alpha brothers in here supporting you tonight. Hey, hello to all my frere brothers. I know Pete real well, um, and I'm sure I've seen these other brothers somewhere along the line. But certainly want to say hello to all of them. Sure, absolutely. So while we're talking about that, Ron, you, you know, you've been successful in your career, successful in, in your family life as well, but you also do a lot of things giving back. And I know the Alphas uh, do a lot of, of giving back and you're always traveling with Alpha. So kind of talk about, you know, you're traveling, you're, you, the stuff you do with the Alphas and Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Seth, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. That's truly my passion, too, when you talk about those things. I have a lot of fun. People say, you need to join this organization. You need to join that organization. You need to join 100 Black Men. And nothing against all these organizations. Please don't, don't, don't go down that road. But I said I could do all those things through Alpha. And Alpha gives me the opportunity to do it with that, um, with, with, the, with the mighty plus, if you will. Instead of me doing it by myself, I get an opportunity to do it with uh, hundreds and sometimes thousands of brothers. So we have an, a, a bigger impact in that commonality of one pushing to that same common goal. Um, uh, I would tell you, it's funny. Uh, I didn't know, uh, to be honest with you. I, I went back um, to one, it was one of our uh, reunions. I pledged back in uh, fall of 1982 and uh, went back for a reunion. And, you know, my chapter was, you know, a pretty good chapter, but we didn't do a lot of stuff from national standpoint. And I asked some of the brothers who, who had, uh, who I was going to say intake me, but we had a different process at the time. And um, 
I said, did you guys see all of this? And they go like, yeah, we, we knew back then. And I'm, I don't know if they were telling the truth or not, but one day I was going through some, um, some plaques and stuff. Um, I think when we had somehow went through something and I saw something that I had completely forgot about when I was in college as a college brother. We did something um, with the, I think it was called the JCs in Lafayette, um, Louisiana, where we got a chance to go volunteer and, and do some of that stuff. And, you know, and I completely forgot about it. So it started way back then about giving back, if you will. And that's the one thing I love about doing that. When I got involved with the fraternity, I knew, I didn't know then, but um, they did tell me this was a lifetime commitment. You're not joining for X, Y, and Z. So I did like that. So I got the opportunity to matriculate throughout the organization held several levels um, at the college level, then at the alumni level, and subsequently getting the opportunity and the privilege of, of running in one of our five regions um, as the uh, vice president in the Western region. And I, I would tell you um, that probably helped me be even that much more of a, um, be involved with volunteering and giving back. That old initiative about too much who has been given exceedingly more is required of him or her. Uh, I certainly subscribe to that and believe that. Uh, I remember um, when uh, we coach, in fact, I coach uh, your, your son's basketball team and I help coach the team mm -hmm. and everybody would, you know, talk about daddy ball, you know, about you're going to play your son, you're going to play your son. And and I remember every time we go to an arena, they were like, which one's your kid? Which one's your kid? And I'm like, none of them are my kid. And they look like, you, you don't have a kid on the on an AAU team, no? And you coaching? Yeah. And and I remember telling the, the young men this and, and I'm sure said, um, uh, your your son will tell you the same thing. I told him you're going to be much better, much better men at the end of the day than you're going to ever be basketball players. And most of them, the funny part is they went and played football at college level if they did that. But what I wanted them to understand was how do you calculate a GPA? Do you know what a GPA is? So that whole mentorship for me is not something I play with. I think it's something that we have to be very serious about. And uh, so much so when um, Alphas have a partnership with Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America, and I remember they kept, you know, trying to get recruits and volunteers. And I kept telling them, I said, I'm going to do it, but I, I can't do it because I need to commit myself first to my son. Once my son go off to college and then I'll be able to, to, to become. And that's why the, the year I knew when exactly when I started doing it, because when Ron graduated from high school, the first thing I did was made a phone call and became a big brother. And I told them, even here in the Houston market, they go like, well, we need people in the third ward area. That I said, I'm sure you do but we also need people in the, in the uh, suburbs as well. And I refuse to volunteer for anything where I'm just gonna be a name on a piece of paper. I need to be able to get to that kid real fast, 15 minutes. And they go like, well, you know, I said, no, let me tell you, call me when you have a kid that's gonna be within 15 driving minutes from my house. And I know what 15 minutes looks like from my house. And so I've been able to get partnered with several kids throughout the years. And I still maintain a relationship with these young men. And um, I was in, um, Miami one time, one of the kids I was a big brother for here, Ellison had moved, his mom had subsequently, and grandmother and, and sister subsequently moved to um, Miami um, area. And so I went down to visit him. And ironically or not, at the time, I think I went quite twice to visit him, but one time um, there was a basketball, there was a football game, there was an inaugural football game going on in Miami, and I can't even remember the name of it, but two of our former basketball players were playing against each other. Jordan Leslie was on one side playing for Utah. And then uh, another young man who became an alpha was playing on, uh, on the other side. So it was kind of funny. So we're at the football game and they're like, which team you're pulling for? I said, both. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like BYU against uh, Memphis State. And, oh, uh, it was so Martin. Cool to... Yeah, it was Martin. Martin was playing for uh, Memphis State. And at the time, he had already pledged and became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. So uh, that was pretty cool. So I got a I have pictures with both Jordan and kids that I call them kids because they were like, what, freshmen or sophomores when I started um, trying to uh, impact their lives and have some fun with them growing up. Right, right, right. So the answer, the answer, I apologize, but uh, that's clearly one of those key passions for me. OK, awesome. Awesome, Ron. I, I'm enjoying this conversation with you. Hopefully you are uh, as well. And I know that my audience is uh, gaining a lot from your knowledge and experience. So, you know, we all go through up times and great times and, and, and success in our careers, but we all have failed at one time or another. Right. Sure. Tell us about a time where you <laughs> failed and the lesson you learned from it. 
Boy, I would tell you there's so many to pick from. I think, um, and trying to think from a from a professional standpoint, feeling, uh, boy, you know, maybe, the, maybe the, what comes to mind. You didn't meet your your maybe it's a year your team didn't meet your goal, and what did you do to help make sure that that didn't happen? I, I would tell you the, the biggest thing from my standpoint that um, because I you like the bonuses and when you don't hit the numbers, you obviously don't get the bonus piece, you know, but that part's okay too. That's, that's not it. Um, the part that probably disappoints me the most is when I'll get back um, surveys. And in fact, it's kind of weird you ask um, that question because um, we do what we call engagement surveys. And I just had a Skype meeting, well, not Skype. Now we have a new whatever today. And I went over with my team Um despite all the work you put in and, you know, you feel like you're cranking on all cylinders. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I get these surveys and I'm like, the first thing is like, what, you know, the first thing you, and, uh, and when I met with my team, the first thing I told them, I own these numbers, you know, there was two categories in particular that was really low. Um, and, and that I was like, man, I really failed. And I was talking to my manager and she said, well, Ron, you have to remember this. Um, your team has changed you about 40% turnover on your team. We took the um, survey right around COVID-19, right before it really kicked in. But the truth is that to me, that was all a bunch of excuses. At the end of the day, I, I, I have to hold myself accountable. And there was one question on there in particular that really resonated with me and probably caused me to lose some sleep. And it was like um, two, actually. The one was, does my manager have my back or cover is what we call it in our engagement survey. And to me, I'm like, I thought that I, everything I've done, you know, and constantly throughout my career was to let people know, you know, tell me so then I can cover you. If you don't, then it's hard for me to cover you what I don't know what you're doing. So that score really, really kind of, to me, was a failure. Um, and then there was one that talked about, I feel comfortable talking to my manager. And I know people say, well, Ron, who you think? They don't want to tell you. They're going to tell everybody but you. <laughs> but to me, those were, those were pretty tough for me to kind of because you know you think you you think you did a great job you, you had a great year and from a standpoint you know if you if you have anything to do with the food companies today you had a phenomenal year because of COVID-19 I, every I mean we made our Q4 numbers with two months left you know in the quarter oh, because wow. you know people buying like crazy you know it, 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 it happens so you have a great year and so everybody's like yeah man this is feeling good and I'm like Man, these numbers suck. And then you had to turn around today when I was talking to my team, and you know, and then you start talking about it, and then it's crickets. You know, it's like sixteen people crickets. I'm like, okay, here's game plan. How do we get better? How do I get better? Not we, because it's me. I own that piece because it's the survey is how they reflect. And so that would to me, that's that's because it's how people look at me. Sure. So um, and it came through a survey. So that to me was. Um, and for me, I've never had a survey score that low. So that was like, what the heck's going on here? So uh, that's probably the most recent one. I would tell you, we go through some, the, the toughest other times I would tell you said had nothing to do with work. Because to me, I probably for the last 20, 25 years, I've kept work in perspective. Work is what I do, is not who I am. It's an aspect of what I do. Yes. Um, I, I, I just... Don't, um, and especially if you started in corporate America uh, back in 19, early 80s, 85, 84, 85, you know that the doors were not exactly quite open for everybody, not the same opportunities for everyone. Right. And at a very, very early age, I think my second manager told me, I don't call that a disappointment, honestly, but but it, it was something that I had to deal with real early. He said, hey, no matter how good you're going to be and you are there's going to be a, a glass ceiling that's going to be a lot closer to your head than other people's heads. But your opportunity as an African-American, this brother happened to be African-American who passed away, really, really good friend and mentor, said that your job, Ron, your biggest opportunity is to be able to open doors for more people coming behind you so that they will have those opportunities to push that ceiling even that much further. So yeah. 35 years later, you know, I still take a lot of pride in that and watching that. So, but it, when you say disappointments, that would probably be it, how people see me and view me when, when it comes to the test scores. That would probably be it. Okay. Awesome, brother. Um, you know, it's amazing, but we are already at 730. We've been here an hour and um, it just seemed like time went by um, 
uh, really, really quick. But I, I do have one other question because I, I just think it's important um, for people to understand um, leadership, how you think, um, and and planning. So, um, what what's one thing? or maybe two things that you would tell an emerging leader or someone that is trying to come up the corporate ladder? What would you, what would advice would you give them to help them understand the best way to navigate their career and the corporate ladder? Yeah, boy, that's the first thing I would tell anybody said is to make sure you have some mentors, find some mentorship. And if they may look like you and they may not, but and you know, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. If you can, you know, sponsors kind of happen a little bit later since you said that as they're starting their career. Mm -hmm. I would tell them that is to is to have a good mentor. And if you need more than one, then ask for more than one. And when you're seeking that mentor, even though you don't fully understand, but find something about him or her that you think resonates with you that you like or admire, the best thing to do when you ever try to recruit anybody to be a um a, a, I don't want to use the word sponsor, but to represent you is to be able to tell them why. It's to say to Cedric, hey, Cedric, I had the opportunity to watch you. I really like the way you're doing X, Y, and Z. I really think I can benefit substantially by being underneath your tutelage. Would you mind if you, I would you like to serve as my mentor as I try to navigate through this and have a safe space? Finding safe space and sounding boards for someone who's trying to make their way up their career is so critical because even though corporate America has changed quite a bit, not knowing what doors, um, where the hot stove is and where to, where to avoid those pitfalls. Sometimes before your career gets started, unfortunately it could be derailed and not having someone to help you navigate through that can, can that, that, that's one of the first things I would tell somebody. Obviously the other thing I would tell you is uh, ethics and having a good work um, ethic and, and having some, I guess I'm a cheating Cedric and said having some integrity about you. And, and the way I define integrity is what are you doing when nobody's watching you? And being able to um, just do that because that's the right thing to do. You've probably seen on my emails, um, I, I talk about that all the time. Um, mm -hmm. um, and th that's something that I truly subscribe to that I think um, anybody who's starting off or anywhere throughout, but in particular when you're starting your career, find a good mentor. And the truth is the mentor doesn't have to necessarily be with that company, it could be somebody outside. There's several people. The truth is I probably mentor as many people outside of General Mills as I do within General Mills. And some some of those businesses have absolutely, positively, unequivocally nothing to do with General Mills. It could be in the whole health, fair, a health career. It doesn't matter. It's somebody who's been there a little bit more and help you navigate before you go into that meeting to say, hey, oh, what do I say? How do I say it? Sometimes even going to that dinner, what's on the... You know, even though they tell you get whatever you want, you know, sometimes because you don't know, you haven't been coached, you think right. that really means get whatever you want. And that's not really what that really means. And that's what some of the things a mentor can help you to avoid those pitfalls that comes with that. So hopefully that that's a couple of little nuggets I would share, uh, share with somebody. Yes, those are awesome nuggets, uh, Ron. So hold on a second. Don't hang up. Um, so, hey, guys, tonight, I, I hope that you got a lot out of our conversation with Ron Celestine. Ron, again, has 35 years, 34 years um, history with General Mills. Now, that's a long time, folks. And he's leading a sales organization. Um, so hopefully tonight you got some things out that you can use in your career. It doesn't matter if you're in sales or not, if you're in, in sales, if you're a teacher, if you are, um, um, you know, driving a truck, it doesn't matter. Think about the mindset, um, things that Ron talked about and uh, use those nuggets to help you in your career. So thank you guys for joining Talk Leadership with Cedric. And, you know, everybody needs a little TLC from now, uh, every now and then. So um, I hope that you um, will join us again next Monday night um, for Talk Leadership with Cedric at 6.30 p.m. But before I go, I want to say that on tomorrow night, at 6.30 right here, we will be having a panel discussion specifically around the uh, Joyce, uh, George Flood situation. So you want to be here tonight to join that panel discussion. I'm going to have three distinguished guests that's going to help us navigate this and talk about this. And uh, we will take questions as well. So join us tomorrow night at 6.30 uh, p.m. Central Time right here 
Everybody needs a little TLC. All right, Ron.